national intelligence responsibilities. Thank you. Last question, Mr. Bray. If you would, uh, I'm a Navy pilot. I've um, encountered a UAP. Walk me through the reporting protocol um, once I see something that I think needs reported. Uh, <clears throat> the first thing that that uh, aviator would do uh, after landing as a part of uh, their normal uh, debriefing is they would uh, uh, contact their uh, intelligence officer. Their intelligence officer would then uh, walk them through uh, first filing a, um, first actually, data preservation to, in, to ensure that, uh, that whatever sensor data uh, may be on the aircraft, that we preserve that um, so that it's available for, for later analysis. Um, second, they would actually fill out a, a, a form uh, that, uh, that includes details like where they were operating, altitudes they were operating, speeds, what they observed, uh, whatever sensor data, sensor data they uh, may have recorded from that. Uh, and then that report uh, is filed. It goes two places. One, it goes through, um, through the operational uh, chain of command so that operational units are aware of what, uh, what's being observed and also th uh, to the UAP task force so that they can take that data, uh, database it, uh, and uh, quite often uh, have individuals from the task force uh, contact the aviator uh, and ask them additional questions if there were things that weren't clear uh, in, the, uh, in the report. Uh, that then goes into a, um, uh, into a, a database uh, where we begin to compare it with other um, observations that we have, again, comparing for locations, comparing for altitudes, speeds, shapes, uh, if any RF emissions were detected from the platform, uh, all of that so that we can try to reach some conclusions on that. Thank you. Yield back. Gentleman yields back. Chairman Schiff. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Bray, can you rerun that first uh, image that looked like it was outside of a plane window? Um, and if you wouldn't mind going up to the screen and tell us what we're, what we're seeing. Uh, I, not that you can necessarily tell us what we're seeing, but right. explain what we should be looking at in that first image. Absolutely. Uh, and Alexi, what I'll ask is if you can stop it at a certain point. And are we looking outside of a uh, civilian aircraft window? Is that what we're looking at? We're looking outside of a U.S. Navy uh, FAC. Okay. Is that it right there? Uh, can you point to the screen again what we're supposed to be looking at? Okay, if you could stop that frame. That's not the one. No, it's not the one. Oh, 
Alexei, just push play. Let's see if. Uh, Here's what you'll see coming up right here. Is that there it went? Now back up just a. Spherical object right here. It zooms by the window uh, right in this area right there. See that part right there again going by? I think we're having a hard time stopping at the right spot. Okay. So as you can see, it's difficult. To, and I think a part of the issue here is the um, the laptop we're working with uh, is yeah. not as easy for us stopping that video we'll, in the right we'll, spot. We'll, we'll describe what, what we have seen in that. Uh, what are we observing? Uh, what you see here uh, is an um, uh, aircraft that is uh, operating in a, uh, uh, in a U.S. Navy uh, training range uh, that has observed a spherical object uh, in that area. Uh, and as they fly by it, they take a video. You see a... Um, it looks uh, reflective in this video, somewhat reflective, uh, and it quickly passes by uh, the cockpit of the, uh, of the aircraft. And is this one of the phenomena that we can't explain? I do not have an explanation for what this, this specific uh, uh, object is. And is this one of the situations where it is, that's the, that's the object that we're looking at right there? Thank you. Um, and is this a situation where it was observed by the pilot, and it was also recorded by the aircraft's instruments. Uh, we'll talk about the multi-sensor part uh, in a later session. Uh, but in this case, uh, we have at least that. Um, in, in the Director of National Intelligence uh, 2021 unclassified report, um, the ODNI reported 144 UAPs between 2004 and 2021, 80% uh, 80 of which were uh, recorded on multiple instruments. Um, and I take it with respect to some of those, you had the pilot, a pilot seeing them if it was observed by a pilot, right. and you had multiple instruments recording it. So you really have three sensors, the human sensor and two uh, technical uh, sensors detecting the object, is that? For the, for the majority of... Uh uh, incidents that we had in the uh, uh, last year's report, uh, the majority had multi-sensor data. Uh, when I talk about the 400 reports that we have now, uh, I, that number will certainly go down because a lot of those uh, new reports that we have are actually historic reports that are narrative-based. So that percentage will go down just as a uh, factor of uh, the fact that the that the destigmatization has resulted in more narrative reports. And, and that's the object we're looking at right there now. Right? That's it right there. Okay. Um, last year's report also said that of those 144, 18 of them uh, reportedly appear to exhibit unusual flight characteristics, appear to demonstrate advanced technology, uh, and some of them appeared to remain stationary in winds aloft, move against the wind, maneuver abruptly, or move at considerable speed without discernible means of propulsion. Um, that's pretty intriguing, uh, uh, and, and if you're able to answer this uh, in this setting, are we aware of any uh, foreign adversary capable of moving objects uh, without any discernible means of propulsion? Um, I think I would, uh, without discernible means of propulsion, I would say that uh, we're not aware of any adversary that can move an object without discernible means of propulsion. Uh, the question then becomes, in many of these cases where we don't have a discernible mean of propulsion in the data that we have, um, in some cases uh, um, there is likely sensor artifacts uh, that, uh, that, that may be hiding some of that. Uh, there's certainly some degree of, uh, of something that looks like signature management that we have seen from some of these uh, uh, UAP. Uh, but I would, I would caution, I would simply say that there are a number of, uh, of events in which we do not have an explanation, in which the, and there are a small handful in which there are flight characteristics or signature management um, that we can't explain with the data that we have. 
Um, we'll continue. Those are obviously the ones that are of most interest to us. Uh, earlier when we asked about how you uh, avoid technological surprise, the biggest way you avoid technological surprise is by collecting this type of data and by importantly um, calibrating the assumptions that you go into with how you do that analysis. I'll tell you, within the UAP Task Force, we have uh, one basic assumption, and that is that generally speaking, generally speaking, our sensors operate as designed. Um, and we make that assumption because many times these are multi-sensor uh, collections. We make no assumptions about uh, the origin of this uh, or that there may or may not be some sort of technology that we don't understand. That's, I think, the key to avoiding technological surprises by calibrating those assumptions. And finally, um, with respect to the second two videos uh, showing the small triangles, um, the hypothesis is that those are uh, commercial drones that, uh, because of the use of night vision goggles, appear like triangles? Is that the operating assessment? Some type of, uh, of drone, uh, some type of, uh, of unmanned aerial system, uh, and it is simply that that light source uh, resolves itself through the, um, uh, through the night vision goggles onto the SLR camera as a triangle. And have we, in order to prove that hypothesis, uh, flown a drone uh, and observed it with that same technology to see whether we can reprodu reproduce the effect? The UAP Task Force is aware of studies that have done that. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. The gentleman yields back. Dr. Winstrup. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you all for